Well, welcome back. We're glad for you to uh, join us for another session of our Generations Workshop. We're considering uh, the strengths of each generation and looking at how uh, we can all work together to fulfill the mission of Christ here at the Beltline Church of Christ. Uh, we're excited to have our panel with us again. You'll notice that we're all wearing the same thing. It's not uh, that we uh, wore the same things back again, but we were just here still doing another one at the same time. And so we wanted to uh, use a little bit more time as we consider the traditionalist generation and uh, hopefully uh, it will be something that, that we all learn something from and that we are uh, encouraged by the wisdom that we find here. And so uh, we're going to, again, let you guys introduce yourselves. I know that we've done that already once in the last session, but we're going to do it again so that uh, as we start this one, as, as there may be some different viewers. This time we'll start down on the other end with Clay. Let him introduce himself and remember to tell us the years that you were a teenager. Uh, my name is Clay Smith, and I just finished my junior year of high school, so I'm still a teenager. Okay. <laughs> I'm Kelly Holcomb, and I was in high school from 2001 to 2005. I'm Ray Ashby, and I was in high school from 58 to 65. I'm Shirley Terry, and I was in high school, I think, I remember, 1954. I don't know when I was there. <laughs> 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 Sometime around 54 or 57, uh, yeah. right? Okay. I'm Rosemary Wright, and I was in high school from 55 to 59. Wonderful. Excellent. Well, um, so we have three representing the traditionalist generation, and we have one millennial in Kelly and one Generation Z in Clay. And uh, actually, Ray is, is, a, is what we would call a cusper. He is right on the edge between the traditionalists and the baby boomers. And so uh, a lot of his life was lived uh, more as a baby boomer, yet you were raised in the country. And so that would have tied you a lot more uh, closely to the traditionalists. And so that's a, that's a blessing in and of itself, is it not? All right, so uh, we've talked about the stereotype, the difference between a stereotype and a generalization in each one of these sessions because it's a very important thing. Uh, it's something that we're experiencing right now, even in our country, as uh, we look at uh, the differences in people. Generations aren't the only differences we have. We have differences of, of races. We have differences, of course, male and female. We have uh, different uh, nationalities and so many different things that come into uh, not only the United States, but the church, that the church is made up of, of many differences. Uh, people with many differences, and yet God calls us to a unity that, that goes over all those. Remember, he says that in Christ there's not male or female or slave and they're free. There's, there's no uh, um, Greek or Jew. He says we're all one in Christ. And so when he says this to us, he teaches us, listen, uh, we can drop all the stereotypes. We can drop all those things. And remember, the most important thing is Jesus, that we have Jesus in common. Now, in our last session, we started talking a little bit about lived experiences versus learned experiences or taught experiences. Um, you may have heard the, uh, the phrase before, give a man a fish, feed him for a day. And then what's the rest of that? Teach him how to fish and he can feed himself. There you go. <laughs> Teach him how to fish. He can feed himself. He can, he, he'll, he'll feed him for, for the rest of his life. All right, so here's my question. How many of you have ever shelled peas on the front porch with your grandparents? Okay. Not grandparents. Maybe not with grandparents, but you've shelled peas. Absolutely. All right. And so it's one thing for us to talk about shelling peas and to, to think about uh, your thumb going through there, right, and popping each little pea out. And uh, after you get done with a bushel, the different color that your thumb becomes, right? <laughs> we can talk about it. Uh, or we could go on to Google and type that in and watch a video of someone else doing it. And so we could learn about it, or like you, we could have experienced it in our life. And so would you say that there's a pretty big difference in learning about something from Google or from learning about it some other way rather than having experienced it yourself? You need, <laughs> Rosemary wants everybody to shell some peas. <laughs> All right. <laughs> need to have a sore thumb. All right. So hold your, make sure you hold your microphone up. All right. And so uh, how about preparing a chicken for dinner? Have any of you ever prepared a chicken for dinner? I've cut. Uh oh, now we're, we're starting to separate, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. I've cut the head off with an axe. There you go. It has to happen. 
flipped an axe, and I saw that chicken flopping around for a week every time I'd close my eyes. Well, we, we were ringers at my house. Yeah? Yeah. All right. <laughs> you grab one up, and you ring it till it pops off and leaves. All right. You didn't have no axe. You just well, we, ringers. It was quicker. Hey. You could two good turns, and he's gone. Two good turns, and it's done. And it has to be done if you're going to eat chicken for dinner, correct? Right. Sunday, um, Sunday it, dinner with chicken day. That, that's right, right? Preach the word, eat the bird. <laughs> and so uh, if, if the chicken doesn't, doesn't meet his end, then you're not going to have chicken for dinner, correct? <laughs> All right. Well, Today, usually, there's not a, a, a chicken that dies by the hand of the one who is eating it. Usually, we just go through the drive through right? And uh, we never have to see the chicken alive. He's just fried and ready to eat by the time we get him. And so there's a pretty big difference. And there's a little bit lost, don't you think, in the lived experience of preparing something for dinner and uh, the learned experience when you know that Something had to happen to that chicken to get him to where he is right now. Um, you know, when you think about the sacrifice in the Bible, when you consider back in the Old Testament, something that would have been very real to the people over and over again uh, is the sacrificial system that was set up under the law of Moses. Uh, that, uh, that place, the, first the tabernacle and then, of course, the temple, there is an altar there where sacrifices are made continually, okay? And so there would have been uh, different animals that were sacrificed for different things, but it would not have been a, a very uh, pleasant-smelling place would it? It wouldn't have been a place that you would have hung out. It wouldn't have been a place that you were like, I can't wait to get there. You know, <laughs> it would have been um, uh, bloody and it would have been smelly and it would have been maybe even shocking, you know, to, to behold in person. And so to have experienced that would have been uh, maybe something. It would have been very different from what we experience today. And I think that maybe the younger generations would benefit from, from the realization that in order for something good to have occurred, like having chicken for dinner, something had to die. And the same thing is true through the scriptures. You know, it teaches us that without blood, there is no life. The life is in the blood. Over and over again through the book of Leviticus, it teaches us that the life is in the blood. And so, of course, that brings us to the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice that was made for you and I. Uh, he gave himself in order to redeem us from our sins. And, and so we have the gospel, his death, burial, and resurrection. And what a beautiful story it is. But it is a story sometimes that uh, us and in, in our younger generations, we don't necessarily think about necessarily the blood, which is something that, that you three have seen and maybe even gotten on you <laughs> when you were preparing dinner, when you were uh, preparing uh, uh, something for, for your family, something good that came from something that maybe wasn't as pleasant as you would like to it have been. So there's a pretty big difference in uh, lived experience and taught or learned experience. How about picking cotton? Has have anybody on this stage ever picked cotton before? Yes. Yeah? Okay, there we go. Um, and so uh, there's a very, very vast difference. In Hebrews chapter 5, uh, starting in verse 8, it says, Though he was a son, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This scripture is in reference to Jesus Christ. And it's saying that Jesus actually learned something, that he learned obedience, and he learned it through something it says, that which he suffered. Um, was there suffering in your life? And, and uh, we don't have to go super deep on this, but uh, tell us, is there things that you've suffered that have brought about a deeper faith, a deeper walk with God uh, through your life? A little bit deeper question than we've had yet. <laughs> well, it should have been. My daddy left us when I was oh, six, seven years old, just me and my mama. And, uh, but, you know, I've always had the Lord. He's okay. always been with me. Wonderful. And I've always known it. That's, that's beautiful. What a beautiful story. You know, to know that you, you've always had a father I've who loved you. I've always had a father. Absolutely. That's right. My mother had surgery, a brain tumor. My mother had a brain tumor when I was in the ninth or tenth grade. And that was a very trying time Absolutely. for me. Yeah. But everything was okay. Yeah. <laughs> you came through it. Yes. That's right. 
Yes, prayer. Yeah. Well, you don't have a prayer. testimony until you've had a test. That's exactly right. Right. And so uh, um, there's some strength that can be gained in our lives, uh, those of us in the younger generations, uh, from those who have come before us. Uh, many of the things that, that we suffer, many of the things that we face in our lives, They've, they've faced before. Or even if they haven't personally faced, they've walked with someone who did. And so uh, it's, a sh it's a strength that we have in the church to be able to rely on one another and to listen to the stories that each of us have uh, that would uh, help us gain experience. Uh, this experience, it teaches us in Hebrews 5, helped to qualify Jesus as Savior. And so uh, how does experience qualify people that you know uh, maybe at school or at work and in the church. What are some things that we think of as, as something that qualifies someone or, or makes someone maybe worthy that we want to hear what they have to say? Why don't we start down there with our younger, younger guys? Um, I think just life experience is what you have that experience to be able to tell other people about how, what they might face, what they might have to go through later. Yeah, it's a powerful thing, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I, I could say just working as um, a supervisor and being involved in hiring decisions, that was something that became clear pretty quickly that you know the difference in lived and learned experience, um, degrees are wonderful and they are necessary for a lot of positions, but the best degrees don't always bring with them the experience that you would desire from, from someone that you're hiring. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, when it comes to the church, I think something that is spectacular is uh, Jesus qualifies us, doesn't he? He, he qualifies us. And so when we come to the church and we, uh, we repent of our sins, we are immersed for the forgiveness of our sins, we rise up out of that watery grave, out of baptism, uh, made new, a Christian. And that new Christian is just as certain to be in heaven with, uh, with his Savior as the, the oldest, uh, silver-haired, uh, faithful Christian in the crowd, isn't he? And what a, what a beautiful uh, thing that is that Jesus brings us uh, qualification. He's the one who brings us to where we need to be. Over in Psalm 78, in verse 4, it says, We will not hide them, meaning the teachings of God. We will not hide them from, their, from the children. We will tell the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done. Uh, a psalm uh, exclaiming the, the praises of God and how this must be told to the next generation, how it needs to be passed down to each generation. Of course, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 4, we have a, a very important passage passage, one I think that's probably familiar to most of us. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates." So why are the older generations told to teach or to guide the younger generations? Why do you think the scriptures give that responsibility? They come up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Okay. And we have failed so, parents have failed so drastically now because <laughs> children are not being taught. Well, A that's, lot of them. Yeah, A lot, we, we're blessed to have some that's taught, but so many is not taught the word of the Lord right. and how important he should be in their life absolutely the old saying the spoil you spare the rod you spoil the child yeah. didn't happen in our house the rod came right quick yeah <laughs> and you remembered the lessons from the rod or the, in my case a, a razor strap oh yeah uh, you, well <laughs> uh we, some of us uh, needed of less us, than others us right look, some of us look around and it would say that one needs a spanking. <laughs> and My dad used to tell me the story of uh, when he would leave for school and his dad would meet him at the door and he'd whoop him with his belt and dad would say, what's that for? And he'd say, that's for what you did yesterday that I didn't find out about. And he'd start to walk again and Papa would get him again. He'd say, well, what was that one for? He said, that's for what you're thinking about me right now. <laughs> And then dad started walking again, and he'd get him again, and he'd say, well, what about that one? He said, that's for what you're going to do a little later. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, 
It is. It's a, it's a little bit different. I, uh, you, you brought up that you had never been spanked before, and so that's pretty impressive to make it through your generation without a spanking. How did you manage that? I was always a good child. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> when you don't have to, when you don't act up, you don't have to worry about it, right? No. <laughs> I think Ray and I, I probably one lived time. a little different life there. <laughs> oh, yeah. My mama was going to spank me, and I ran. Oh, yeah? And she called me, and my nose started bleeding. Oh, saved by the bleeding nose. Uh-huh. And then she <laughs> didn't spank saved, me. Saved by the blood again, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. That's great. Okay, so um, how should it look? How should this be played out? We read from two Old Testament verses, and so we can look back in those day and age and and say, okay, we knew that these families, they would have lived together, and so there would have been teaching at home, and there would have been instruction. There wasn't any TV. You know, there wasn't anything to do like that. There was time to listen, though, a lot of time to listen. And so we have a lot of oral history, you know, back in these days. And so, you know, they're taught, hey, hand this down to your children. Teach these words uh, that, that they might know them also. So how will it look in Christian community, in the, in the church? How does this happen? How can we pass on uh, the stories, your stories of faith, and the stories that we read from the Scriptures to the younger generations? What do you think? Well, one thing someone brought, uh, you brought up, Sister Terry, about the parents. Number one, parents... And yeah, you parents have, have a them. responsibility, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, what else? How else could the, could the church together help teach our children? I look, I, I came up in a little church in Cortland. It's about 30 some people. Yeah. And I was the only young person there. Yeah. And I remember Miss Wells, Mr. Collins, and those older men, and that one woman that took me under their wing. and. I, it's a blessing that I would not take anything for. Wonderful. There you go. Well, that old saying that uh, it takes the community to raise a child. Yes. Same with the church. It takes the entire church to keep and teach the younger people. Absolutely. And it's not necessarily by, by word, but more by lifestyle and living and doing, carrying on the, without uh, you know, direct set down book, chapter, and verse. Okay. Absolutely. I think uh, that that idea of it takes a village probably originates right there in the scriptures, doesn't it? Um, God gave us the church for a reason, and he wants us to to live that out, to share our experiences and to help one another uh, with the uh, the things that we have to face and the the uh, the lives that we have to live. Um, a couple more scriptures in Psalm 66 and verse 16. It says, Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will declare what He has done for my soul. That's Psalm 66, 16. In Psalm 71 and 15, it says, My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and your salvation all the day, for I do not know their limits. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness, of yours only. And Jesus once told a, a man who lived among the tombs after he had healed him and, 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 and uh, thrown the, uh, the evil spirits out of him in Luke eight thirty nine. Jesus told him, return to your house and tell what great things God has done for you. He went on his way and he proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. And I think maybe these teachings are something that we need to capture, recapture in the church for us to tell our stories. When uh, a, a prayer request is made and someone says, you know, I, I'm going through this specific struggle and that specific struggle is one, you say, I've been there. Then I would encourage you and anyone who's listening, when we get to be back in this building together, that you would rush to the front, that you would sit by that person, that you would look over at them and say, I've been there, I know. Because a shared suffering I think would probably be the, the most powerful thing that we have in this in this world, a shared uh, suffering. And I think that uh, really when we look at the gospel, is it not the shared suffering with our Savior that saves us? The gospel of Christ is death, burial, resurrection. Uh, it's, it's a suffering that he went through in order to redeem us from our sins. And so I don't think it should be surprising that when uh, we go through a struggle, And when we hear of someone else facing the same type of struggle, that we would be able to go to them. And when we say, me too, when we say, I know what you feel, it's powerful and it's helpful and it's godly to speak up and to tell your story, to tell your story with with, uh, Jesus on your heart and in your your mind and on your lips that they might 
learn to praise God even through the storm that they might have to face. Um, Miss Terry brought up some of the people who taught her and the relationships that she had back at the she grew up in. And so uh, that might be something that would be interesting, I think, uh, maybe for another session for us to explore some of those who taught us and the important moments and the stories of faith that you've learned from them. Um, all right, so spiritually, have you noticed the difference between lived and taught experiences when you consider loving our neighbors? In the last uh, session, we talked about uh, two different mindsets. One, uh, the, the younger generations of thinking, I want to be all things to all people, and the older generations thinking, I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. And so these two different mindsets that come together that give us what we have in the church right now, um, <clears throat> how do you think that that might affect how we go about doing our mission trips or how we go about serving one another in love. Do you think that it's a strength or do you think that it might be something we need to work through as a, as a difficulty? How does, it, how does it come to you? Maybe an opportunity for us to grow? Okay, absolutely. Um, Ray and I have actually got to work together on a mission trip down in Mexico and uh, he helped teach me how to build uh, chairs and tables for students uh, to be able to, to learn at. And uh, it was not something that was natural to me, but uh, I learned over some time and, and eventually understood what we were doing. And it was a great experience for me to get to do that. Well, I was in school for 29 and a half years and I had a, a white feel, so to speak. But I had uh, kids that would come and sit on my lap and and uh, that never got any attention at home, and uh, it was just, it was just wonderful to be to teach those children. Absolutely, to show them the love of Christ mm -hmm. through your love. Absolutely, that's great. This okay, looks, so we're going to move into a different uh, idea, a different thought process now. Um, there's something that each generation has. Uh, that we sometimes would refer to as ghost stories. I'm not talking about, ooh, you know, scary ghost stories. I'm talking about actual ghost stories, maybe even uh, maybe called urban legends, because every generation has events, circumstances, things that have happened that change and shape the lives that they are living. And so uh, in, in different generations, we've had these different instances. I would suggest that the three big ghost stories of the traditionalist generation would, of course, be the Great Depression, World War II, and also the move from farm to city. Uh, there was a, a huge move in your generation from farm to city. We get the, you know, the beginning of the suburbs in the 50s and into the 60s. And so uh, that was a, a very big shift for many families in your generation. So as you consider those things and uh, look at the ghost stories, how did these events affect your family? Uh, did you feel any effects of the Great Depression or of the war or of the move, the change uh, during your life? I remember when they... Uh bummed and uh, I was about I guess six or seven and I can remember all my we used to have an old radio and every people would gather around it yeah. and uh, when they bummed uh, Pearl Harbor then I remember mom and all of them just crying and jumping up and crying and, and of course you know if they were crying I cried <laughs> I yeah, didn't know absolutely. what I was wow yeah but so it it's, was it's a, something that you remember very to this traumatic day. Uh -huh. yeah the shock and the and it would have been a very scary moment in time, to yeah. the uncertainty that would have come at that time. Yeah, I guess the closest thing that I have to that is 9-11. That's the only thing that, that uh, I, I really could relate to, to that. And uh, what, a, what a time, what an well, event. It was horrible. That I was at school, and uh, my son called and said, Mama, you won't believe what happened. Right. 9-11. Yeah. When the space shuttle exploded. Right, Challenger. You know, that was, that was so heartbreaking to yeah. me, you know, yeah. all of those people, you know, yeah. just. I, I was in fifth grade when that happened. <laughs> I was, and of course I grew up in Florida, and so we were all outside watching. Watching, uh-huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's a, that was a big event in my life, too. Yeah. I got neckties older than you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all right. They're coming back in style now, right? <laughs> that's great. Well, do you, you younger generations think of any uh, ghost stories of our generations, of, of uh, things that you've lived through? Uh, I, I mean, I think September 11th is, is um, probably the biggest that, that I can think of. I can still remember the seat that I was in in my second period. 
ninth grade drama class. Um, we heard an announcement uh, over the intercom and everybody turned on the, the news channel to watch the coverage and it was just, I still remember just kind of the impact and the feeling of, it felt unreal. Right, yeah, gut-wrenching, absolutely. Um, Clay, what do you think? Has there, has there been a ghost story established for Generation Z yet? Um, I think right now with the whole coronavirus and pandemic and yeah. all the riots that are happening and like the Australia wild, wildfires even earlier. Yeah. Um, I remember we were sitting at a baseball game and I heard that the NCAA was canceling March Madness and then all from there it just kind of felt like a dream. Yeah. It was like, it was scary, but uh, I think that's a ghost story that I'll be able to tell forever. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you one uh, that, that Generation Z has that maybe not even the millennials, to some extent millennials, but my generation, Generation X, we definitely never, never even considered um, that Clay does deal with and that maybe we don't notice or think about it as much, but uh, the younger generations uh, have to deal with the school shootings that have been occurring over the last few years, you know, and that's something that's definitely on their, their hearts that they, they recognize as reality that none of us, you know, uh, ever, ever really thought of or, or had happen in our lives. And yet I know that y'all deal with that and, and you deal with it um, really kind of the way that we've dealt with some of the other things that have come through. And, and maybe Generation Z has the strength, you know, to deal with those things and to continue to go to school, continue to be lights in darkness, uh, even though uh, those things do occur in, in their lifetime. Um, okay, so uh, we, we're going to have to start wrapping things up. And uh, in our first session, we talked a little bit about caution and confidence. And we look at the caution of the generations and the confidence of the generations. And in the first session, we talked about that uh, we don't mean this in a derogatory way whatsoever, but that there is a very distinct caution and confidence cycle that seems to occur in our country and in the generations that have come through. But it also is something that we can parallel with the people of Israel uh, back in the, in the Old Testament, the Bible, when you have the, the first generation out of Egypt and you go to the second generation and third generation and fourth generation, it looks very much like the traditionalist generation, the baby boomer generation, generation X, and as you go along. And so as one generation faces some very hard, difficult task, it seems like they take on a, a cautious attitude and a, a, a very conservative approach to things. The next generation is just a little bit less and usually a little bit more confident in the things that they're doing. Uh, not too long after that, another generation comes along that again has to face hard times and they become more cautious and then the cycle repeats itself over and over. So we see that even in our generations also. Um, how do you think that those uh, cycles of caution and confidence could be a strength to the church as we move forward together? What do you think? Could it be a strength to us? And do you think your generation is cautious or confident? This would be a generalization, right? <laughs> God's in control. God's in control. Amen. That's right. Okay. Well, um, we sure do appreciate you guys being here and choosing to, to make yourselves vulnerable for us to ask these questions and, and just to consider these things, to, to sit up here. And it's a little bit hot in here, I know. And so I really appreciate you uh, giving of yourselves to, this, to the congregation. Uh, and I know nobody's sitting in these pews, but if they were, I know they want to give you a big round of applause and just thank you and, uh, and appreciate you very much. And I, I certainly do appreciate you choosing to be here. I'm going to close with this scripture from Philippians chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you. I long to see you, my dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown I receive for my work. You know, for our traditionalist brothers and sisters. Uh, I hope that you, uh, like Paul as he's writing this to the Philippians, uh, will look at the younger generations as a joy and a crown to what you have been through, to what you have taught us and to what you have, have lived before us. And we appreciate you very much and uh, thank you for your sacrifice and for uh, your example to us in Jesus. Uh, let's, let's have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father, we again just thank you so much for the traditionalist generation. We ask your blessings on them. We ask you to help us to serve them with love and kindness. And help us, Father, as we respect their stories and as we listen carefully to the things that will guide us in our lives also. We love you, Father, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.